this barber shop in Mobile, Alabama, where behind it was records. It was a record distributor, but now it's a barber shop. So you can get like a fade and like a Skin Williams 45, you know what I mean? What's up? This is Cut Chemist, and you are checking out Crate Diggers. Peace. How many records do I have? Um, in this room, uh, I've done an approximate bin count, and there's about 15,000, uh, a few thousand more in the house, and then probably about this many at my mom's house. Sorry, mom. This is a converted horse stable into a record storage, hence the name of my label is a stable sound. This is the stable. And these are my horses. Um, this wall is probably the most put together, this one here. Mostly hip hop and some disco, as you could see here. 70s, and then it goes all the way down here to about, not too far past like 93. More contemporary stuff like you'll see 90s to 2000s. Um, stuff like Relativity, Rockus, and ABB. Local labels from the East Coast and West Coast, People Under the Stairs, obviously, stuff like that. Loud Records, which is a very impressive catalog from <laughs> here to like here, you know? It's not bad and I still don't have all of them. Correct Records, comps down here, and then Imports, UK Hip Hop, Tommy Boy. Here's all Warner, it goes like Warner and then subsidiaries of Warner Atlantic, Sire, First Priority Atlantic, goes here. So I keep a pretty strict filing system there. Up here is old stuff, jazz, soul, rock, Warner Atlantic over there. There's ABC, ABC Impulse, Columbia, Sound of Philly, Capital, Polydor over there. World stuff, Stax, yeah, Stax is here, mainstream here. Uh, CTI, Kudu, Motown, all the Def Jam stuff. One thing you can look at is what label got the most usage over the years. If you look at Def Jam, spines are split, Ding Corners, those records got a lot of mileage. I, I grew up in Hollywood, California. My mother played piano. My dad wrote music and played guitar. Music was just all around the house. He was really into folk music and Bob Dylan and stuff like that. And they somehow befriended one of the Winans, uh, this guy David Winans. He ended up being my babysitter and he was the most gifted musician and he would invite friends over and they would jam and I'd just be sitting and check this, checking this thing out. I, drum kits, guitars, joints, you know? I mean, it was just like, music was everywhere, people were everywhere, it was really celebrated. My very first records that I was cutting up, like uh, the Bob James that I bought, of course it's the second press on Tap and Z, but uh, nevertheless. Another one that got a lot of mileage was, you know, Cybertron, you know, R9, and Clear, stuff like that. A lot of these are my very first records. Um, Hashim, I don't know what it's doing in this sleeve, but, but it is. Oh, wait. Oh, this one has Micah Nine's phone number, by the way. <laughs> I remember, he was like, hey man, let's do some work together, and it was at the, uh, at the gaslight, and he wrote his number down. Crazy. We were touring colleges for my sister, because she was graduating high school, and we wanted to see if there was a place, and I thought this was the perfect opportunity. I'm 13 years old, I'm going to New York for the first time, and all this stuff that I love about hip hop is, is New York based, and I wanna, I wanna, you know, this is my chance to go figure it out. What, what is this? This is crazy. I don't think I've ever done anything like this before in my life. I went down to the library, the local library, and I checked out phone books from those cities, and I looked up records, and I jotted down every record store I could find out of, the, out of that phone book in, that, in, in Yellow Pages. So I had my list, my Bible of record stores. I don't even do that now, you know what I mean? I'm like 39. But when I was 13, I was killing it. And uh, we we're, were going through uh, Philly. I think that was the first spot I really remember. And my mom is asking the hotel guy, like, hey, my son's looking for record stores. I was like, mom, 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 I got it covered, you know, I need your help. And she's like, well, this guy just came up with a record store name at uh, some place called Funkamart. I was like, yeah, of course, it's not on the list. What the hell? And um, this is on Market Street in Philadelphia, 1986. Just run into the store and I'm just like, hey, look, I'm looking for this, 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 you know. And they're like, well, here are all the new releases. Um, that's rap. And I'm like, okay, well, what about. 
uh, what's that record they use uh, that Grandmaster Flash is cutting up in Wild Style? And they're also using Peter Piper. And he's like, oh, that's, that's right here. That's um, this record. I was like, really? This is a jazz record. He's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, can I get two of those? Boom, yeah, it's two of those. I said, okay, um, do you have anything else like that that DJs would, like old records, not really rap records, but, and he handed me, it was the first year that they came out with um, Ultimate Beats and Breaks. So he gave me um, two copies of the one with Apache on it. And that was pretty much the beginning of break collecting. This was the first time I, I started obtaining records and hence begins a larger scope of what to start completing. But it was great to come back to LA and no one was playing like Devils of Mardi Gras back then and Scratch Under the Funk, you know, that, that had just come out. Uh, Robbie B and Jazzy J. Uh, boogie Down, like all that stuff. I, I was kind of the man right, um, in 86 out here for that because no one, no one was, was buying stuff like that. This is what they use to press records from. It's not the plate, but it's the lacquer. What they do is they cut the lacquer at the mastering lab, they make a mother mold out of metal, and then press the records off the mother mold. I was so excited this was the very first Jurassic 5 record, it's called, uh, before we were called Jurassic 5, it was called Unified Revolution. Cut at Richard Simpson's in 1994. And I was so excited that I put out a record that I couldn't wait for the record to come back from the plant. So I took this to the club, to the gaslight, and, I, and it, since it doesn't clear the 12, I had to post it up on a spool of tape and put the needle up on top. And I debuted Unified Revolution by Jurassic 5 at a club off the lacquer. People were like, what in the hell is going on? So I was watching the Crate Diggers, uh, Jazzy Jeff, and he had this uh, um, in the background. This is my mom's house, this picture that I took for a college, uh, a college art photography class. And I took pictures of people's record collections. I was basically biting a B plus idea. And, um, and anyway, so I took one of my own and that's the A track that we recorded on. And those are the records on the ceiling, and that was my, at the time that I shot this, my Holy Grail record was The Meter's first album, which I bought when I was in high school. I'm gonna tell the Brazil one, just because I think we turned that country upside down. I think we changed the, the, the whole like, infrastructure of their economy, <laughs> just based on the, how many of us there were. Babu, J-Rock, me, uh, Mad Lib, Egon, B Plus and, and Eric Coleman were there already like a month or whatever telling us like we've done the research. This is and so we just were behind them and it was like they brought in the army and so here we go here come the American DJs and uh, I like to call it the big dig and we bought and bought and bought. In fact that may have been amount, the most amount of records I ever bought in, in one trip. You know, not a lot of people were buying the type of music we were looking for. I mean, you know, we were looking for Brazilian hip hop, Brazilian random rap, Bra um, Brazilian funk, Brazilian psychedelic rock, which was the, the big thing. I remember when we found Boogaloo Combo, we thought we struck gold. It was like, boom, Boogaloo Combo? Hot Pants Road, you kidding me? And you know, relatively cheap. Man, I went back there a few years later and it was like, everybody's a record expert. All the prices went through the roof. We kind of shot ourselves in the foot, you know, by going around to every store and being like, this is what we're looking for, this is what's up. You know, they're really quick to know what your taste is. You know, if there's a dollar amount attached to it, then they're gonna be like, oh, I think you might like this. It's got fuzz guitar and a drum break. You know, oh yeah, hell yeah, I want that. When I would go to a record store and they'd have a customized bag, I'd always hold on to it because I knew that I would probably want to do some Sistine Chapel version of record digging. Funkamart, Philly, 1986, right here. That was the big deal. You could buy TVs, turntables, records, amazing. Music Factory, Stanley Platzer. Bought records off Stan the Man himself. Super Disco Breaks, Tough City stuff, uh, it was amazing. St. Mark Sounds in the Village, that was awesome. Tower Records on 66 and Broadway was really cool. Fourth and Broadway I thought was a little better. Music City in Watts. That place was something else. You could find sealed Dorothy Ashby's for $4. I found Drive's Lonnie Smith there, sealed like that many of them. Mr. Bongo in London. Hi-Fi Records in Chicago. I was with Peanut Butter Wolf when he found 
a, a Convention 81. Metropolis Dis in Rome, Italy. Skippy White's in Boston, great basement. Second Coming, New York City. Uh, my dad went in there and then they've had like Bob Dylan bootleg, like show bootlegs, it was crazy. Nice price books in Raleigh, Durham. Manhattan Records in Japan, in Tokyo. Cisco Records in Shibuya. Like pff, sealed, spoon and wrap, colored vinyls, it was crazy. <laughs> Funniest name ever for a record store? That's in Osaka. Where the hell is this? Oh, Buenos Aires. One thing they have a lot of out there that I love to collect is bootleg American disco and funk comps. Groove Riders was a store in the valley that I used to work at. And in fact, I probably met Peanut Butter Wolf when he was working at TRC as, um, as a rep. Everyday Music in Portland, Oregon. Portland's crazy for records. I don't know what it is about that place, but a ton of records come through there. Okay, so you have It's Yours, right? This is Teela Rock, one of my favorite rap records of all time. This one doesn't have the Def Jam logo, this is the first press. But that's not what's impressive. What's impressive is the test pressing. You see the nice little dollar price tag from Aaron's Records. This is the best part. Take it out. And in red pen, music connection. Now let's cross that out. And it says Rick Rubin, 4208666. Let's call the number. I'm assuming it's a 212 prefix. So, anyway, and it's in really good shape. As you're going, the new, you have a new grail item that keeps eluding you. The record back then was Planet Rock. I couldn't find it. How do I find this Planet Rock record? And then when you find it, oh no, forget that. Now I need this Beat Goes On record. Can't find it anywhere. You get Beat Goes On. Now it's. Anybody have this Jive Rhythm Tracks? I gotta have that. No one, it's rare, man. Can't find it anywhere. And you get that and slowly, you know, so I mean, my collecting fanatic uh, behavior comes from obviously not having something. I mean, I think that's where a lot of people get it.